that I should get myself a moustache. <laughs> there are many ways to describe Dantewara. It's an oxymoron. It's a border town smack in the heart of India. It's the epicenter of a war. It's an upside down, inside out town. In Dantewada, the police wear plain clothes and the rebels wear uniforms. The jail superintendent is in jail and the prisoners are free. 300 of them escaped from the old town jail two years ago, but it's filled now again. <coughs> Women who've been raped are in police custody. The rapists give speeches in the bazaar. Across the Indrawati River, in the area controlled by the Maoists, is the place the police call Pakistan. <coughs> there the villages are empty, but the forest is full of people. Children who ought to be in school run wild. In the lovely forest villages, the concrete school buildings have either been blown up and lie in a heap, or they are full of policemen. The deadly war that's unfolding in the jungle is a war that the government of India is both proud and shy of. Operation Green Hunt has been proclaimed as well as denied. P. Chidambaram, India's Home Minister and CEO of the war, says it does not exist, that it's a media creation. And yet, substantial funds have been allocated to it and tens of thousands of troops are being mobilized for it. Though the theater of war is in the jungles of central India, it will have serious consequences for us all. If ghosts are the lingering spirits of someone or something that has ceased to exist, then perhaps the National Mineral Development Corporation's new four-lane highway crashing through the forest is the opposite of a ghost. Perhaps it's the harbinger of what is still to come. The antagonists in the forest are disparate and unequal in almost every way. On one side is a massive paramilitary force armed with the money, the firepower, the media, and the hubris of an emerging superpower. On the other, ordinary villagers armed with traditional weapons, backed by a superbly organized, hugely motivated Maoist guerrilla fighting force with an extraordinary and violent history of armed rebellion. The Maoists and the paramilitary are old adversaries and have fought older avatars of each other several times before. Telangana in the 50s, West Bengal, Bihar, Sri Kakulam in Andhra Pradesh in the late 60s and 70s, and then again Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, and Maharashtra in the 80s all the way through to the present. They are familiar with each other's tactics and have studied each other's combat manuals closely. Each time it seemed as though the Maoists or their previous avatars had not just been defeated but literally physically exterminated. Each time they have re-emerged more organized, more determined and more influential than ever. Today, the insurrection has spread through the mineral-rich forests of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, and West Bengal, homeland to millions of India's tribal people, dreamland to the corporate world. It's easier on the liberal conscience to believe that the war in the forest is a war between the government of India and the Maoists, who call elections a sham, parliament a pigsty, and have openly declared their intention to overthrow the Indian state. It's convenient to forget that indigenous people in, in central India have a history of resistance that predates Mao by centuries. That's a truism, of course. If they didn't, they wouldn't exist. Their rebellions were cruelly crushed and many thousands killed, but the people were never conquered. Even after independence, tribal people were at the heart of the first uprising that could be described as Maoist in Nakshalbari in the village West Bengal, where the word Nakshalite, now used interchangeably with Maoist, originates. Since then, Nakshalite politics has been inextricably <coughs> entwined with tribal uprisings, which says as much about the tribals as it does about the Nakshalites. This legacy of rebellion has left behind a furious people 
who have been deliberately isolated and marginalized by the Indian government. The Indian constitution, the moral underpinning of Indian democracy, was adopted by parliament in 1950. It was a tragic day for indigenous people. The constitution ratified colonial policy and made the state custodian of tribal homelands. Overnight, it turned the entire indigenous population into squatters on their own land. It denied them their traditional rights to forest produce. It criminalized a whole way of life. In exchange for the right to vote, it snatched away their right to livelihood and dignity. Having dispossessed them and pushed them into a downward spiral of indigence in a cruel slate of hand, the government began to use their own penury against them. Each time it needed to displace a large population for dams, irrigation projects, or mines, it talked of bringing tribals into the mainstream or of giving them the fruits of modern development. Of the tens of millions of internally displaced people, more than 30 million by big dams alone, refugees of India's progress, the great majority are tribal people. So when the government begins to talk of tribal welfare, it's time to worry. Over the past five years or so, the governments of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, and West Bengal have signed hundreds of MOUs with corporate houses worth several billion rupees, all of them secret, for, st for steel plants, sponge iron factories, power plants, aluminum refineries, dams, and mines. In order for the MOUs to be translated into real money, the people must be moved, and therefore this war. When a country that calls itself a democracy openly declares war within its borders, what does that war look like? Does the resistance stand a chance? Should it? Who are the Maoists? Are they just violent nihilists foisting an outdated ideology on tribal people, goading them into a hopeless insurrection? What lessons have they learned from their past experience? Is armed struggle intrinsically undemocratic? Is the sandwich theory of ordinary people being caught in the crossfire between the state and the Maoists an accurate one? Are Maoists and tribals two entirely discrete categories as is being made out? Do their interests converge? Have they learned anything from each other? Have they changed each other? The day before I left, my mother called, sounding sleepy. I've been thinking, she said, with a mother's weird instinct, what this country needs is revolution. <laughs> An article on the internet says that Israel's Mossad is training 30 high-ranking high Indian police officers in the techniques of targeted assassinations to render the Maoist organization headless. There's talk in the press about the new hardware that's been bought from Israel, laser range finders, thermal imaging equipment, and unmanned drones so popular with the US Army, perfect weapons to use against the poor. I arrived at the Ma Dante Shuri Mandir well in time for my appointment, first day, first show. I had my camera, my small coconut, and a powdery red tikka on my forehead. I wondered if someone was watching me and having a laugh. Within minutes, a young boy approached me. He had a cap and a backpack school bag, chipped red nail polish on his fingernails. No Hindi outlook no bananas. Are you the one who's going in? He asked me. No, Namaskar Guruji. I didn't know what to say. He took out a soggy note from his pocket and handed it to me. It said, Outlook nahi mila. Couldn't, couldn't find Outlook. <laughs> and the bananas? I ate them, he said. I got hungry. <laughs> he really was a security threat. His backpack said, Charlie Brown, not your ordinary blockhead. <laughs> he said his name 
was wrong too. I soon learned that the, dan the, the, the that Dandakaranya, the forest I was about to enter, was full of people who had many names and fluid identities. It was like balm to me that idea. How lovely not to be stuck with yourself, to become someone else for a while. We walked to the bus stand only a few minutes away from the temple. It was already crowded. Things happened quickly. There were two men on motorbikes. There was no conversation, just a glance of acknowledgement, a shifting of body weight, the revving of engines. I had no idea where we were going. We passed the house of the superintendent of police, which I recognized from my last visit. He was a candid man, the <coughs> superintendent. See, ma'am, frankly speaking, this problem can't be solved by us, police or military. The problem with these tribal people is they don't understand greed. Unless they become greedy, there's no hope for us. I have told my boss, remove the force and instead put a TV in every room, every home. Everything will be automatically sorted out. In no time at all, we were riding out of town. No tail. It was a long ride, three hours by my watch. It ended abruptly in the middle of nowhere on an empty road with forest on either side. Mangtu got off and I did too. The bikes left and I picked up my backpack and followed the small internal security challenge into the forest. It was a beautiful day. The forest floor was a carpet of gold. In a while we emerged on the white sandy banks of a broad flat, flat river. It was obviously monsoon fed, so now it was more or less a sand flat. At the center, a, steam ang a stream anchor deep, easy to wade across. And across was Pakistan. Out there, ma'am, the candid SP had said to me, my boys shoot to kill. I remembered that as we began to cross. I saw us in a policeman's rifle sights, tiny figures in a landscape, easy to pick off. But Mangtu seemed quite unconcerned, and I took my cue from him. So. I could read a bit more or try yes. to chat with him. Why don't you? Do choices, choices. Oh, see, I heard about that. You're a Sagittarius too, aren't you? <laughs> uh, this whole choosing thing is just impossible. <laughs> and we Sagittarius also do not like to be categorized. <laughs> are, we just, are we terrorists or just militants? <laughs> um, okay. I'll, I'll read because I, I actually prefer reading to talking, but uh, it, it, it gives you an idea of some of the issues that, that are involved in then we talk. So um, actually, after I walked into the forest, then we got, basically we got lost because the, the contact didn't arrive. So for two days, two, two days, two and a half days, we were walking, waiting, hoping, and then finally, you know, finally the contact was made. But then I'll just tell you about arriving at the camp first. So we're waiting in this village, and how it works is that um, a whole group of villagers have, have, a, have a sort of young militia. They're called the Sangam. And they're, the, they're, the, you know, they're not the PLGA. They're not the guerrilla army. They're just the people who... Who, who, who are lookouts and who you know who work with the villagers who warn because there's a serious siege uh, you know I'll, I'll come to that later where basically shoot to kill means shoot to kill and burn down villages rape women uh, torture all of that is going on so this is my first encounter with the with the militia before I met the PLG about 20 young people arrived girls and boys in their teens and early 20s. Chandu, who was one of the other guides, explains that this is the village level militia, the lowest rung of the Maoist military hierarchy. 
I have never seen anyone like them before. They are dressed in saris and lungis, some in frayed olive green fatigues. The boys wear jewelry and headgear. Every one of them has a muzzle-loading rifle, what's called a bharmar. Some also have knives, axes, a bow and arrow. One boy carries a crude mortar fashioned out of a heavy three-foot galvanized iron pipe. It's filled with gunpowder and shrapnel and, and ready to be fired. It makes a big noise but can only be used once. Still, it scares the police, they say, and giggle. War doesn't seem to be uppermost on their minds, perhaps because their area is just outside the home range of the Salvajulum. The Salvajulum is the people's militia that has been raised by the government of tribal people. You know, it's like pitting indigenous people against indigenous people. They've just finished a day's work helping to build fencing around some village houses to keep the goats out of the fields. They're full of fun and curiosity. The girls are confident and easy with the boys. I have a sense of this sort of thing and I'm impressed. Their job, Chandu says, is to patrol and protect a group of four or five villages and to help in the fields, clean wells or repair houses, doing whatever is needed. After dinner, without much talk, everyone falls in line. Clearly, we're moving. Everything moves with us, the rice, vegetables, pots and pans. We leave the school compound and walk single file into the forest. In less than half an hour, we arrive in a glade where we're going to sleep. There's absolutely no noise. Within minutes, everyone has spread their blue plastic sheets, sheets the ubiquitous jilli, without which there will be no revolution. Chandu and Mantu share one and spread one out for me. They find me the best place by the best gray rock. Chandu says he sent a message to the comrades. If they get it, they'll be dead first thing in the morning, if they get it. It's the most beautiful room I've slept in in a long time. My private suite in a thousand star hotel. I'm surrounded by these strange, beautiful children with their curious arsenal. They're all Maoists for sure. Are they all going to die? Is the jungle warfare college for them? And the helicopter gunships, the thermal imaging, and the laser range finders. Why must they die? What for? To turn all of this into a mine? I remember my visit to the open cast ore mines in Orissa. There was a forest there once, and children like these. But now the land is like a raw red wound. Dust fills your nostrils and lungs. The water is red. The air is red. The people are red. Their lungs and hair are red. All day and all night, trucks rumble through their villages, bumper to bumper. Thousands and thousands of trucks carrying iron ore to Paradeep port from where it will go to China. And there it will turn into cars and smoke and sudden cities that spring up overnight into a growth rate that leaves economists <coughs> breathless into weapons that make war. Everyone's asleep except for the sentries who take one and a half hour shift. <coughs> Finally, I can look at the stars. When I was a child growing up on the banks of the Minichil River, I used to think the sound of crickets, which always started up at twilight, was the sound of stars revving up, getting ready to shine. I'm surprised at how much I love being here. There's nowhere else in the world that I would rather be. Who should I be tonight? Comrade Rahil, under the stars. Maybe. The comrades will come tomorrow. They arrive early in the morning. I can see them from a distance, about 15 of them, all in olive green uniforms running towards us. Even from a distance, from the way they run, I can tell they are the heavy hitters, the People's Liberation Guerrilla Army, the PLGA, for whom the thermal imaging and laser guided rifles, for whom the jungle warfare school. They carry serious rifles, INSAS, SLR, to have AK-47s. 
The leader of the squad is Comrade Madhav, who's been with the party since he was nine. He's from Warangal, Andhra Pradesh. These, these comrades have been in the forest for 30 years, working among people. He's upset school run wild. In the lovely forest villages, the concrete school buildings have either been blown up and lie in a heap, or they're full of policemen. The deadly war that's unfolding in the jungle is a war that the government of India is both proud and shy of. Operation Green Hunt has been proclaimed as well as denied. P. Chidambaram, India's Home Minister and CEO of the war, says we, 300 of them escaped from the old town jail two years ago, but it's filled now again. <coughs> Women who've been raped are in police custody. The rapists give speeches in the bazaar. Across the Indrawati River, in the area controlled by the Maoists, is the place the police call Pakistan. <coughs> there the villages are empty, but the forest is full of people. Children who ought to be in school, I should get myself a moustache. <laughs> there are many ways to describe Dantewara. It's an oxymoron. It's a border town smack in the heart of India. It's the epicenter of a war. It's an upside down, inside out town. In Dantewada, the police wear plain clothes and the rebels wear uniforms. The jail superintendent is in jail and the prisoners are free. It does not exist, that is a media creation. And yet, substantial funds have been allocated to it and tens of thousands of troops are being mobilized for it. Though the theater of war is in the jungles of central India, it will have serious consequences for us all. If ghosts are the lingering spirits of someone or something that has ceased to exist, then perhaps the National Mineral Development Corporation's new four-lane highway crashing through the forest is the opposite of a ghost. Perhaps it's the harbinger of what is still to come. The antagonists in the forest are disparate and unequal in almost every way. On one side is a massive paramilitary force armed with the money, the firepower, the media, and the hubris of an emerging superpower 